Hey, Vince McMahon, it's time for this week's Stick to Wrestling podcast. <laughs> oh, no, give me a break. Oh, brother. Wake up, Maggie. I think I got something to say to you. You should listen to the Stick to Wrestling podcast. I want to thank Rod Stewart for writing that song about his favorite podcast, Stick to Wrestling, where if you give us 60 minutes, perhaps indeed, we will give you a wicked good and raw bone podcast. Stick to Wrestling is a weekly wrestling discussion where we largely talk about wrestling from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and that's what we're going to be doing today. Before we get to that, I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. It's a bunch of cool guys talking about wrestling and God knows what else we've got pictures results dancing scungias free parking pizza by the slice you name it we got it my twitter situation has been fixed so follow me on twitter just search john mcadam and follow the guy who has the stick to wrestling logo as his avatar i largely stick to wrestling on twitter and if you by the way if um i hope everyone had a great thanksgiving yesterday we're going to be talking about thanksgiving wrestling 1982 but before i get to that this is a free and ad free podcast if you would like to donate to the stick to wrestling podcast if you'd like to give me some friggin money uh, PayPal me at Pro Wrestling Archives. That's all one word at gmail.com, and I will be very grateful. And with that, we are recording a couple of days before Thanksgiving. This show comes out on Friday, no- November the 25th. 40 years ago today, November 25th, 1982, was Thanksgiving, and there was a lot of wrestling, and we're going to talk about it. I want to bring on our returning guest. He was great the first time, Chris Berg. Chris, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me, John. <laughs> He's such a polite Midwesterner. I love this guy. I am. I am. <laughs> All right. Uh, The first show we will discuss took place on Thanksgiving Day 40 years ago at the Omni in Atlanta. Uh, The opener. Now, every year, traditionally, the Georgia territory had a big card on Thanksgiving with a tag team title tournament. Usually the Georgia or Georgia or by this point, national tag team champions where always something happened and the championship was held up. Oh, gosh. And the winner of the tournament not only gets $10,000, but they were the Georgia or National Tag Team Champions. This did not happen on this night. The first match. Oh, it didn't. No, it didn't. Okay. I I know. They they did that like magic every single year. Oh, the belts are held up like on November 1st. But I I don't think it happened this time. The opener was in the tournament, the Moondogs against Les Thornton and Billy Red Eagle. Chris, I, I have something to say about Les Thornton. 40 years ago when he was on TV, I was like, this guy is boring. And boy, was I young, wrong, and misinformed. Les Thornton was a master inside that ring. Same here. And if he was in the business today, he would be a huge star on the level of like a Brian Danielson kind of kind of guy. I, I agree. And I, I saw a special on his wrestling school maybe 30 years ago. And I don't know if anyone really successful ever came out of that, but I was impressed with what was going on in, in his school. I mean, it was just typical Les Thornton, a lot of mat wrestling. I didn't appreciate the style when I was a kid, but I appreciate it now. Yeah, my I do as well. It's something that I think just, you know, as a kid, you're you know, looking for great big guys. And, and I think we'll get to that a little later, too, with when we talk about the WWF card. I was looking for, as you know, I was, what, 17? I was looking for charismatic guys who did these, you know, crazy interviews. And, you know, I, I liked a guy with a good gimmick. And, and Les Thornton had none of those things, but he was so good in the ring. Yes. All right. Next up, we have the tag team of Tito Santana and Brad Armstrong defeating Hiro Matsuda and Yoshiaki Yatsu, two guys who don't care about Thanksgiving, uh, making a special appearance (laughs) in the Atlanta Omni. Tito Santana and Brad Armstrong, that would be an excellent team. Yeah, I was thinking that as well, that, that that would be something really to see. Both those guys were excellent in the ring. You know, Santana, both Santana and Armstrong had good tag teams with other guys, too, kind of similar styles. I I would have loved to see this. 
Yeah, I'm Tito Santana had an excellent tag team with Rick Martel, not only yep. in the WWF, but back in your home territory in the AWA, Chris. Yeah, they had a series of matches with the High Flyers that uh, were excellent, absolutely excellent at a time when you didn't really see two babyface teams uh, go against each other. Yeah, I have seen those matches. They are excellent. Um, I mean, I give the guys credit because wrestling a babyface versus a babyface match, it's not easy now, let alone in 1982. No. All right. Next up, Tommy Rich and his cousin, Johnny Rich, defeat the Iron Sheik and Korshia Korchenko. Um little background, yeah, <laughs> a little background. Johnny Rich, I always liked the guy, but he was like uh, Tommy's less, far less talented uh, and charis- far less charismatic cousin. They were, they were cousins as far as I know in real life. They were. They were. I looked that up last night when I was doing some research for this. They were actually cousins, but yeah, Tommy was obviously the, the star of the team. Kortisha Korchenko. Yes, so I didn't know that he was around this early. I thought he only had that run with Watts in like 85 or so when Watts basically ran him out of town legit. Yeah. I did not know he was wrestling as early as, as 82. He was, and he was on WTBS. And the reaction, like when my friends and I saw him, was like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, he looked. Oh, he was a joke. He's awful. He looked like something. He looked like someone drew a cartoon and brought it to life, a, a comical cartoon. And, you know, very rarely will I say a wrestler like I noticed in 1982 that he was particularly good or particularly bad in the ring. I noticed how bad this guy was. Yeah, and he didn't even come across as, as one of the normal fake Russians. He was he was awful. <laughs> you know, he and Soldat Ustinov were probably the worst, quote, Russians in the business. So a question, if, if you go down a little further, Ivan Koloff was on this card. Was he teaming with Ivan there in Georgia? I don't remember them teaming on television. I, I remember Iron, Iron Sheik and Ivan Koloff became a regular tag team, and they were in the main event a few times at the Omni. But so far, you know, nothing happening here. I mean, Johnny Rich, I, let's talk about him for a minute. I liked him, but he was the guy, like, once a year, they'd set up a feud with Tommy Rich where the, the a heel would just beat the crap out of Johnny Rich, and Tommy would run in and make the save, and there you go. I mean, I remember Buzz Sawyer delivering a wicked, bad power slam on the concrete floor uh, to Tommy Rich, just, you know, moving that, uh, putting more juice in that feud. I mean, that was basically Johnny's role his entire career. Yeah, yeah. He had a little bit of success, I think, in uh, like Continental, Southeastern, that area. But, you know, he was never he was never a big star. No, he wasn't. And you know what? Not everyone was put uh, on earth in the wrestling business to be a big star. This was kind of if, no. if Johnny Rich was going to be on WTBS, either this was going to be his role or the role he had in 1989 as part of the party patrol. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 might be one of the worst tag team names of all time, the Party Patrol. That's that's like down there with the rock and roll RPMs and Oof. Oh man. Who who was do you remember his tag team partner with that? I, I should because the guy took great bumps. Who was that guy? Oh, uh it wasn't Scott Armstrong because he was in the rat patrol. Amy Haskins. Okay. Davey Haskins, like me, a huge Tennessee Volunteers fan, which means he's had tears running down his face for the last week. Um, But he would take this amazing bump for Sid where Sid would clothesline him and he would do like this 450 degree flip. And, you know, and it was amazing. And then Sid would get on one knee and say, yeah, yeah, everyone praise me. It's like, no, who's taking the bump here? (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, I, I do remember 1989, Johnny and Davey out there. Hi, I'm Davey, and I'm Johnny, and we're the Party Patrol. It was like, no. <sighs> yeah. So many bad, but you know not, what? Not a great time. 
Ah, I yeah, really. I, I, they were good for what they were. They, they were kind of a not a jobber tag team, but kind of a below the mid card tag team, jobbers to the stars tag team. All right, and next up, we've got the Wild Samoans, Afa and Sika. I believe they were the national tag team champions at this time, and they defeat another team that does not care about Thanksgiving, the Great Kabuki and the Magic Dragon, making the trip from Dallas. So, yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because they are on the world-class card the next night. I was not familiar with Magic Dragon at all, so I looked up who he was. Oh, will you, will you guys hear this story? Go ahead, Chris. He's a guy named Haru Sonata, and that still did not tell me who he was. I literally had never heard of him before. Oh, wow. Okay, he was Professor Sonoda in Florida before he became the Magic Dragon uh, in world class as Kabuki's tag team partner. And clearly, Kabuki was the uh, Batman in this tag team and, and Dragon was yeah. Robin. Yeah. And in 87, Magic Dragon got married and Kabuki bought him the plane tickets for his honeymoon and the plane crashed and Sonata died. Oh, my God. I, I thought that was a story you were going to tell. Yeah, that's a crazy. No, I had no idea. That's horrible. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I, I remember reading about that when it happened and just being like, wow. So, Noda, he could do some acrobatic stuff that you'd say, oh, wow, that was good. But, like, he could never really put a, a wrestling match together. Yeah, I I was completely unfamiliar with him. Even even world class, which we were getting, or we started to get kind of around this time. I still I don't, I don't remember the guy, and we didn't get Florida here, so I've seen very little Florida except many years later. Oh, understandably. I mean, I believe after his world class run uh, was over, I believe he went back to Japan and, and was there to stay. He is, I mean, they have the entire year of 1982 world class available on Peacock if you'd like to check out the Kabuki and Magic Dragon tag team. Now we go to round two. The Moondogs wrecking spot defeat Tito Santana and Brad Armstrong. Chris, I see this as an upset. Yeah, I see this as an upset. It'd be interesting. I couldn't find this card anywhere. I got to think this was some sort of a, I don't know, a count out or something. I, it just doesn't seem, it just seems like a really bad clash of styles as well. Granted, the Moondogs were not exactly my cup of tea anyway. Oh, but. same here. <laughs> I, I remember, you know, they were in the WWF. They did that gimmick in like, you know, late 80, early 81, and into like mid 81. It was just so embarrassing. And then the day comes oh, yeah. where I tune on WTBS and look who's here. Oh, no. I didn't realize they were getting quite this much of a push in Georgia at the time. I really remember them primarily being in the WWF in the 80s as kind of a lower mid card team. Yeah, I mean, all the, the WWF tag team champions were, you know, it was a, a middle of the card thing in the WWF. Now we have another upset. Tommy Rich, who is still one of the most over acts in Georgia, he had peaked, but he was still near the top of the mountain. Again, teaming with Johnny Rich, and they defeat the national tag team champions, the Samoans. I mean, this to me is the perfect opportunity to have Johnny Rich look at the lights and, you know, you get your obvious result, but they didn't do that. Yeah, and you'd almost think you'd have the, well, you'd have the Samoans and the Moondogs in some kind of a huge brawl as as the final final match of the tournament. Were the Samoans kind of on their way out, or did they stick around a little longer? They stuck around very little longer before they left Georgia without giving any notice to go back to the WWF. And, and they were the tag team champions when they left. So believe it or not, Ole was not very happy. Uh, I've referenced this on the show before. As far as I can see, I mean, that was the for real, the first real shot fought in the wrestling wars that, you know, overtook wrestling in the mid 80s. OK, so, you know, if they would have left earlier, then they could have vacated the belts and then it would have been the normal uh, tournament for the titles. 
Excellent point. And I mean, I, you could tell Oli was completely taken by surprise when the Samoans left and he, he bad mouthed them on TV. And he said, you know, wherever they are, the wrestling can't be that good up there or whatever he said. All right. Now we have the finals. And this was a shocker to me. I had no idea until I started researching this show. The Moondogs won this tournament, defeating Tommy Rich and Johnny Rich. This has got to be the peak of the Moondogs in Georgia because they did not get a big push at all. Both these teams being in the final is weird. Mm. <laughs> Considering that there's, you know, there's a lot of talent in, in this tournament with Santana and Armstrong, uh, Kabuki, the Samoans. Having the Moondogs going over Tommy and Johnny Rich, and you assume Johnny took the fall in this one. You have to. Um, it's, Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm guessing, and this is pure speculation on my part, that Ole figured that he could build up the Samo the Moon Dogs, and build them up as a legit uh, threat to the Samoans. And boy, wouldn't that be a crazy match! And then when the Samoans walked out, he just didn't have anything for the Moon Dogs. And I know some of you are saying, "Well, that's a heel versus heel feud." They tended not to do that. They did Ole Anderson and Stan Hansen against the, the Samoans. So why not? Yeah, and actually the Samoans and Moondogs wouldn't – that would have been pretty entertaining. Did either of them have a manager there at the time? The Samoans had Sonny King as their manager, and I I am like the only one who liked Sonny King at this point in his career. I thought he played his role really well. I, I know I'm in the minority when I say that. Uh, the Moondogs had a manager. I'm trying to think of his name. It didn't last. Uh, I should be more prepared for the show than this. Uh, not Rock Hunter. Um, Homer Odell, that's him. Okay. One of those guys who kind of floated around some of the southern territories for a number of years. Yeah, I know like someone's going to be, oh, McAdams should be more prepared than that. But hey, who could who could pull Homer Odell out of his head that quickly? Who else other than me? Probably a few. Yeah, people. good job. <laughs> And then we have, I mean, you want to talk about talent on this show. Ivan Koloff defeats Paul Orndorff. This had to be some kind of a non-title match because Orndorff was the national heavyweight champion at this point. Yeah, or else some kind of a DQ finish uh, where Orndorff got DQ'd or something. I, I noticed, I had looked up the title histories last night and saw that he was the, uh, that he was the national title cha or national champion at this time. Yeah, hard to believe this has been 20 years since, you know, I would like Paul Orndorff would go on Georgia TV and I'd be like, wow, this guy, this guy has it. Oh, yeah, he had everything. He 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 could have been a world champion, probably should have been anywhere. I mean, if Ric Flair had not existed, had he, you know, gone on to do something else or had the plane crash finished him, I absolutely think Paul Orndorff could have been the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion probably for a long time. And finally, we have a lights out match. Butch Reed is now the guy feuding with Buzz Sawyer. And I tried to find out, Chris, if this was the hair match that they had and i didn't see it listed anywhere but right around this time butch reed defeated uh buzz sawyer in a hair match buzz sawyer they were going to show the film of it and buzz sawyer comes out with the film reel and just tears it apart on tv it was a great moment and after that buzz never had hair again did he not really. No, his hair was falling out quite quickly at this point. Must have had a lot of stress in his life. I am sure that was I'm sure that was what it was. <laughs> All right. So that's the Omni show. God, frankly, compared to some previous Omni shows on Thanksgiving, Chris, this one was a little bit underwhelming. Yeah, and I'm as we move to the JCP show, I'm going to say that's pretty underwhelming too, with the exception of the uh, of two matches. I agree with you, and this was the last time JCP was going to run Greensboro on Thanksgiving without giving it a big name and calling it Starcade. Starcade, yeah. But they 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 did run every Thanksgiving in Greensboro, and like I said, this is, this is the last one where it's not Starcade. Mike Davis over Masafuchi, Johnny Weaver over Ken Timms. Not much to say about either one of these matches, except, well, Johnny Weaver was a big star in the Carolinas in the 60s into the late 70s. And here it is, 1982. 
and I've always been like, you know, wow, they they really protected him out there. Oh yeah, he was one of those guys like uh, George and Sandy Scott, George South, you know, people who were around there for a long time, and they were just kind of there. Yeah, I mean, it was almost like you know their version of I don't know who to compare him to, like maybe Bruno San Martino. They you know, except they just kept him around on the undercard, but you know, barely ever did jobs. And Johnny. I don't have his age in front of me, but he had to be early 50s, and he looked every day of it. He would have been like maybe Pedro Morales in the mid-80s in the WWF. That's a very good comparison. Hulk Hogan era Pedro Morales, who yeah. is just there on the card, and everyone's happy to see him, and he's usually on the undercard. Yep. And yeah, they and they did protect him a little bit in the Northeast and uh, in Boston. He had a couple of matches against Bob Orton Jr. where they they gave it a little bit of a storyline. But yeah, I mean, you know, Pedro is just not going to matter in, in Des Moines or Phoenix, but he fills out the card nicely. Next, we have uh, Frank Monty defeats Ron Ritchie. Frank Monty is a guy I always thought could have had a bigger career. Actually, you could say that about Ron Ritchie too. Bob Orton Jr. defeats Jim Nelson, a future Sergeant Slaughter henchman. Uh, yes, and a future Sergeant Slaughter enemy as well. <laughs> yes, he was. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a story I heard about Jim Nelson. He, This is about five years ago. Uh, I heard he was driving either a Greyhound bus or the equivalent of a Greyhound bus, a, a competitor. And the bus pulls over. They stop at a hotel. He goes in and watches Raw, and he goes into his full uh, – what was his name? As a Russian, I'm losing my mind here. Boris Zukov. Boris Zukov. He goes into full Boris Zukov mode and starts, you know, talking like he's a Russian. And this is not the wrestling we have in Russia. And someone walks up to him and says, I knew you when you were Private Jim Nelson. And he just puts his head down and leaves the bar. Oh, man. That's just. Oh. I, the story starts crazy and, and ends crazy. I love those stories. I guess the one thing is, at least somebody remembered him. <laughs> Not that you could miss him. The guy's head was, like, enormous. He was quite enormous compared to the rest of his body. And, yeah, yeah. he was one of the worst Russians ever. My favorite Boris Zukov moment was he was in Mid-South. And this is a year later, like the mm, summer beginning of fall 83. And Nikolai Volkov shows up. So now we've got two Russians, and Boris Zukov loses a match on TV, and Volkov beats the crap out of him over it, saying, you know, you're not a real Russian. You lost to an American. Oh, that's awesome. Because Volkov was good. Volkov, yeah, Volkov you believed in. He was a really big guy. I, Nikolai Volkov's story, uh, from, and I believe this because I trust this person. He was driving with Nikolai Volkov. They got a flat tire, and Nikolai Volkov took the uh, the bolts off the, the 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 car's wheel with his bare hands. He didn't need uh, uh, tools or anything. The lug nuts. That's what I'm trying to say. I thought you were going to say he lifted up the back of the car instead of using a jack. <laughs> but I would believe that. I would believe that too. He was huge. He was. He was huge and a legitimate powerhouse. Bob Orton Jr. as a baby face. Uh, I remember reading this in the magazines and, and just not knowing what was going on. He had been a heel since the mid 70s. Everywhere he went, as far as I know, he had just been a top heel in the WWF. And here he is in the Carolinas wrestling as a good guy, although we all know what would eventually happen with Orton here. Yes. All right. Next, we have a battle royal uh, for the vacant Mid-Atlantic television title, uh, won by Bad Bad Leroy Brown, who they are pushing as a babyface. I, I, I guess if you like it, you like it, Chris. I don't. And honestly, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't realize he was a babyface here. I assumed that he was a heel. You know what? Actually, I might have just put some egg on my face. I know he was a baby face eventually, but I do think he was a heel here managed by Sir Oliver Humperdinck. My bad, everyone. <laughs> he was an, he was a baby face in 1982 in Georgia, and I just kind of put that out there. But anyway, 
Now we have a really good match, or at least one that on paper should be a phenomenal match. Jack Briscoe, who was still really good in 1982, defeats Greg Valentine. Any thoughts on this one, Chris? So Valentine, I looked this up, Valentine was the U.S. champion here. Briscoe did not win the belt here. Is that correct? That is correct, Jack Briscoe. I, I don't. He never held the uh, that version of the United the United States title. Okay, so it would have been similar to the Koloff Orndorff thing in Georgia. There had to have been some kind of a DQ finish or something. Yeah, either a DQ finish or a non-title match. Probably, right. uh, probably a, a, a DQ finish. Yeah, but yeah, that would have been an excellent match. Oh, for sure. I mean, these guys, you know, Briscoe is an all-time great, and Valentine was was in his prime around here. I remember reading in the magazines that Jack Briscoe had started wrestling in the Mid-Atlantic area, which to me was a shock because I started following wrestling in the magazines in 1976, and Jack Briscoe really never left the state of Florida except to make a a special appearance, like sometimes in Atlanta, I know one time, at least in Memphis. But it's like, you know, wow, he's a regular now in the Mid-Atlantic Territory. He was getting shots at Flair around this time, too, in Mid-Atlantic. Yes, he was. Uh, They brought, I mean, you know, they brought him in as a top guy to start with. And then they kind of, in 83, put the Mid-Atlantic title on him, which by then... Mid Atlantic, you know, you had Mid Atlantic champions like Rufus R. Jones, and you know, just it, the title had been downgraded from what it once was. But then, yep. obviously, we have G- uh, Jerry Briscoe showing up and the Briscoes turning heel, and that was great. That was great. The their whole uh, tag team run was it against uh, Steamboat and Youngblood? Uh, against Steamboat and Youngblood, primarily, yes. Yeah, that was a great run. And again, just so unexpected. I was so taken aback by the idea that Jack Briscoe is a bad guy. Even years later, um, I got the tape of Starcade 83, and I see the Briscoes as heels hanging out with Harley Race and, and Dick Slater. And I'm just like, this picture does not look right to me. No. All right. And finally, we have the three-on-two handicap steel cage match, Jimmy Valiant and Abdul the Butcher, huh, against Sir Oliver Humberjink, Paul Jones, who is still active as a wrestler, wouldn't be for long, and Joe LaDuke. We talk a lot about the Jimmy Valiant versus Paul Jones feud, you know, going on do. forever. It, it dates back to here, and I think as a result – the fact that the Jimmy Valiant versus Sir Oliver Humperdinck feud, or at, at one point it was Sir Oliver Humperdinck and, and Gary Hart as H and H Incorporated, that was a horrible feud too. Yeah. So is this is this the kind of genesis of the uh, Valiant Jones feud? Um, not really. The the uh, that began at the beginning of 1984 when Jones was managing the assassin, and they did an angle where the assassin cut off his beard that Jimmy Valiant had started growing when his first son was born. I miss little things like that in wrestling, Chris. Okay, and the other interesting thing here is Jones was the Mid Atlantic champ in this match. Okay. Which I didn't know either. Yeah, he would soon get into a feud with Jack Briscoe over that title. And I think as a wrestler, that was his re- his last like real feud, his re- last real program with someone. Okay. All right. We skipped the world title match. Oh, he, oh that little thing. <laughs> yeah, not, which I would have loved to have seen this. One last thought on Paul Jones. I remember when he turned heel again beginning of 82 or late 81, and I I saw this on tape, but uh, Jay Youngblood goes on TV and he's like, you know, Paul Jones, you know, we, you turned on us once and we took you back once and we're never taking you back again. Again, a little things like that in wrestling that I miss. Yes. All right. World title match, Ric Flair, the world's heavyweight champion defeats Roddy Piper by disqualification. This may not have been a great show aside from two matches, but that is a star. If they wanted to have Starcade 82, 
this was the main event. You had Ric Flair, obviously the world's heavyweight champion, kind of a tweener in the Carolinas against the newly turned Roddy Piper, who the fans have have gone gaga over. Yeah, I would have. I don't. I don't know if any of this was out on. I don't know if it's on Peacock. I don't think it is. I couldn't find anything for this on YouTube last night. I would have loved to see the interviews leading up to this. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking about two of the absolute, you know, two of the best, two just top shelf all time guys with Flair and Piper, especially if you give them something to talk about. And oh, yeah, Ric Flair will have something to talk about if he's about to fight Roddy Piper. Oh, yeah. And Roddy didn't do the job. Of course not. I believe by this point in his career, Roddy Piper was completely done doing jobs under any circumstance. I mean, you know, middle of 83, he loses the United States Championship to Greg Valentine when the match is stopped for blood. That made no sense. That's the dog collar match, right? No, that was the one where Valentine won the title. And this was about oh, okay. three or four months earlier. Then they have the dog collar match. And without announcing that it's a non-title match, Piper wins it, but he doesn't get the title. It was <laughs> the things you had to do in wrestling. Oh, I forgot about that little uh, that little twist. Yes. Yeah, and within a month, Piper would be gone to the WWF. But that's that's Starcade 83. We'll talk about that. Oh, in about a year or so. All right. Yes. Next up, we talked about this show with Jamie Ward, who attended this show uh, maybe four or five weeks ago. But I, we have a fresh new perspective here. It's the World Wrestling Federation at the Philadelphia Spectrum. Uh, I checked the the... <laughs> The uh, history from the history of WWE.com, this was the only major event that the WWF had on Thanksgiving uh, through the whole Backland era. They usually either stayed home or did something, you know, a, a small show somewhere. But usually they let the guys stay home, not tonight. Okay. I did not know that because Thanksgiving, I mean, here in the AWA area, I mean, that was always a huge night for wrestling both thanksgiving and and often christmas night as well uh i never got to go to any of those shows there's no way my dad was going to take me on a holiday like that but uh, that was the same way you know every time we talk about wrestling on thanksgiving i'd be like you know if they had a big show at the boston garden would you have gone and the answer was no i i, I could not have there's just i had too much to do on thanksgiving you know when i was younger and uh, it would have pained me, but I would have had to skip the, the garden show if they had one, which they never did. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let me see. Spectrum, they drew 15,644 for this. Tiger Mask defeats Eddie Gilbert. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen this match, but it was spectacular. Tiger Mask was, it's was incredible. Great. And, yeah, and Eddie Gilbert remembered the match. Jamie Ward was talking about that. Yeah, I... Uh... I made it a point to, I watched almost all of this card last night. Well, not all of it. There was some stuff that I didn't watch, but I made it a point to seek out this match. And it was really excellent for people who only knew the, the Eddie Gilbert from, you know, mid South and, uh, you know, as the heel or ECW or continental, he was really good in the ring at this point. And it wasn't just because he was going against tiger mask. He was really good here. No, Eddie, you know, he had he's one of those guys he spent his entire life wanting to be a wrestler. His dad was in the business. Eddie was a photographer when he was a teenager. And yeah, he took this seriously. And I know we, we mentioned this on the WWF show, but you know, Chris, you talked about well, if you're if you're only familiar with Eddie and, and the UWF and ECW, I mean his his character was kind of this, you know, nerdy little Southern guy who's, you know, looks a little bit in over his head. Yeah. Was this before his accident? Yes, it was. The accident was, I want to say, January or February 1983. Okay. So that he would have still had a pretty good, I can't talk, athleticism going on here before he got hurt. Exactly that. You know, that was a horrible uh, car accident. He was asleep. He slammed into the back of the truck. The car caught on fire and he had to wear a beard the rest of his life to uh, cover up the scars. I never knew that's why he had a beard. 
I I learned that at some point. Yeah, that you know he he grew it to cover up all the scarring. Chin Kobayashi over Johnny Rods. I, Chris, you're better at certain things than me. I could not find this show on YouTube. Was was Chin Kobayashi better known as Strong Kobayashi? No, I looked this up, um, and of course, then I didn't write that down in my notes. <laughs> I don't believe this was Strong Kobayashi. It was a thinner guy, more of a junior heavyweight. There were there were a number of Japanese wrestlers on this on this card. Okay, that um, this was surprisingly Kobayashi. This uh, this was surprisingly a good match. <laughs> I had no real interest in watching it. It was pretty entertaining. If it now, I think it's Kuniaki Kobayashi, especially given the fact that Saido and Choshu were on the show. Kuniaki right. Kobayashi was amazing, and Johnny Rods could could hold up his end. Oh yeah, and Rods played just the kind of the great kind of bully heel that he did so well. Uh, even though, of course, he ended up losing in a quick pin and getting angry about it. But yeah, he was. This was really a much better match than you would have ever expected it to be. And for whatever reason, despite the legit being from Brooklyn, Johnny Rod seemed to save his best stuff for the Philadelphia Spectrum. I can't explain it. We have a midgets match. Then we have superstar Billy Graham defeating Chief J. Strongbow by countout. Forgive me if I'm repeating, but five years earlier, this uh, Strongbow versus Graham main evented the Boston Garden two or three times, uh, ending with a cage match. And here we are. You know, Chief J. Strongbow is is pretty much the end of the line here. This was awful. It was terrible. (laughs) It (laughs) It was Kung Fu porn stash Billy Graham against big, fat, old J. Strongbow. It was it was awful. Uh, Graham selling for stuff that doesn't look like, you know, it would hurt a child and making these ridiculous facial expressions. This was, this was sad. It was I, not good. I believe, I believe it when you say the word sad. I mean, you know, I talk about, you know, most of the time I didn't notice if a guy was good or bad. Also, most of the time I didn't notice if a wrestler was old and I looked at Chief J. Strombo. I was like, man, this guy is old. Well, and Graham had a bear hug on him. Of course, he could barely get his arms around Ugh. Strongbow. <laughs> and it didn't look like it would, could hurt anybody. It's just, it was, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Superstar Billy Enough Graham. Said. What was, you know, I mean, he, was Superstar Billy Graham, again, I talk about, I notice if guys are good, not good. I didn't notice that Superstar Billy Graham was terrible, or at least in 1982, I wasn't realizing it. Okay, then we I don't have- think I did either because I still thought of him as a big star. Yeah, even when he was in Atlanta in 1985, and they wouldn't put him past the middle of the car. They had him in six mans doing jobs to Sam Houston, and I was like, you know, what are you guys doing? This is superstar Billy Graham. It's like, no, it's superstar Billy Graham's corpse. I now realize. Yeah. All right. Uh, Tony Gurria defeats the raw bone Swede Hansen, who was getting main events in Philly and uh, Madison Square Garden, everywhere else back uh, when he was in the WWF in 1979. Obviously, he has a different role in 1982. So they did an interview be- with Tony Gurria right before this match, calling him the handsomest face in wrestling. That, oh, that's that. I have no idea. No idea why. <laughs> <laughs> Cal Rudman was too yes. much. He was too yes. much. When Rick Martel <laughs> was out there, I mean, the guy is open, like, almost openly fantasizing about Rick Martel. It was insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I could see someone saying that about Martel. I couldn't see that. Let me say that about Tony Gurria. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Gurria was a good-looking guy, like, back in the early 70s. He was the heartthrob, and now, you know, he's right. the heartthrob 10 years later, and it's it's just not there anymore. But anyway. I mean, compared to Swede, anybody's the best-looking guy in wrestling. <laughs> oh, that's a good point, too. Swede Hansen, man. That guy, he was something else. I mean, yeah, I'm not doing enough. I better dye my hair red. But anyway... Two out of three fall match, uh, Pedro Morales and Salvatore Belomo defeat Masa Saido and Ricky Choshu. 
I, I mean, we're talking two of the very best in-ring talents in the world, and Saito and Choshu, uh losing to Salvatore Belomo, who was never any good, and Pedro Morales, who was way past his prime here and there. They're not even a real tag team. I would have way rather have seen Saito and Choshu like against two undercard guys and getting to, to do their stuff and going over. I'm really, if, if some of these matches were intended to air in new Japan, I'm really surprised that this happened. Uh, good point. And they probably did air in Japan, I know they aired a lot of the Madison Square Garden stuff, so I'm I'm kind of making that assumption. But then again, if you're New Japan, you know what you you, you bury these two matches right here with uh, Kobayashi, Saito, and Choshu. Now, talk about bad matches. Jewel Strongbow defeats Baron Mikel Cicluna. I don't know if we've discussed this um, on the show. I it, I mean, I remember the first time I saw Jay bring out his younger brother, Jules, earlier in 1982. I'm like, okay, that's Frank Hill. Yeah, this I, I didn't watch this. One. Good for you. Good for <laughs> like, you. I have no interest in seeing these two do anything. <laughs> And, you know, I, I talked about Strongbow as a guy I looked at and said, OK, he's old. By this point, I'm saying the exact same thing about Baron Mikel Cicluna. I mean, there was really no way to find out the ages of the wrestlers at this point. And for guys like Strongbow and Cicluna, that was a really good thing. Yeah. All right. Next up, the kind of a dream match, believe it or not. Jimmy Snuka and Buddy Rogers defeat Captain Lou Albano and uh, Ray the Crippler Stevens. Stevens had pile driven Jimmy Snuka on the concrete uh, about two months before this, maybe six weeks. So you've got a really big match here. And obviously, everyone wants to see Buddy Rogers get a few shots in on Captain Lou Albano. This was a fun match. You had Stevens beating the crap out of Buddy Rogers for most of the match until Snuka comes in to make the save. Kind of just your kind of traditional storyline there. What I was really shocked at, so Rogers was 61 years old here. And he died only 10 years later. He looked in great shape in this match. I met Buddy Rogers in 19, was it 91? I'm pretty sure it was 91. If not, it was 1990 at one of John Arezzi's conventions. So now he's 71 and he was in phenomenal. And that's how, he, that's how old he was when he died. Okay. So, yeah, Buddy, yeah, I mean, you know, again, for a guy who was out of the business for as long as he was, you know, he figured, okay, he'd start eating and not exercising. No, he looked fantastic here. Yeah, so there's a funny story I read about him probably about seven years after this where he threw a guy, he was in a deli, and some guy came in and was harassing the uh, was harassing the people working behind the counter. Rogers got up, threw him into a soda cooler, and then threw him into the kitchen, and then the guy ran out the door. I heard 68-year-old Buddy Rogers. I heard that story when it happened, and I yeah. I want to say it was 89 or 90, and, you know, Luthez always hated Buddy Rogers. Uh, Sam Martino yes. hated Buddy Rogers. I'll, I'll come right out and say it. I thought Buddy Rogers was more entertaining in and out of the ring than either one of them, and that's not a knock. That's just me saying Buddy Rogers was great. Oh, yeah. He was, I mean, he was flair before flair. He was, you know, kind of the next coming of gorgeous george who kind of perfected that that persona he was he was great yeah, but, but he made a lot of enemies <laughs> he definitely did he said the wrong thing uh about the wrong he he said to luthez you know why do we keep strangler lewis around why is he getting a cut of <laughs> money and Thez never forgave him for that <laughs> nope. nope he didn't anyway yeah Thez, forget it with him and buddy rogers um <laughs> And Antonina Rockable, let's not get into that. Um, yeah. And then final match, Rocky Johnson defeats Mr. Fuji. Rocky was brand new to the WWF. It felt like Mr. Fuji was on his way out. He wasn't, but it felt like he was. So the, the match result makes sense. Rocky was one of those guys, again, a little bit like Magic Dragon. Like he could do certain spots really well, but when it came to putting together a match, not so much. 
I I always liked Rocky. I I liked his work. I think you know some of the things that have come out about him in the past few years kind mm-hmm. of tarnished his reputation a bit. But I I always thought Rocky was Rocky was a really good wrestler. Uh, I was quite a fan of. Uh, I was far more a fan of him than I was of Tony Atlas and that team when they held the tag titles. But I've said before that Tony Atlas is one of my least favorite wrestlers of all time. <laughs> okay. I, I always liked Tony. I, especially as a kid, I, I looked at him and he would be on WTBS in the late seventies. When I first started getting the magazines, like I would not have been surprised to, you know, go into the drugstore, pick up a magazine, open it up and see that Rocky Johnson was the new NWA champion. And when Tony Atlas was in, Georgia uh, early 83 and he was feuding with Ric Flair like I was like I wouldn't be surprised if Tony Atlas were the next or the new NWA champion so they were both very over with me okay <laughs> Chris like oh, all right now we get right. your home territory the St. Paul we skipped, hey whoa, 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 whoa. he skipped the world title match again I did a chat Oh, I don't like talking about those. Why? Do, why am I doing this, Bob? Hold Bash- on, I want to bring up one other thing, quick. I think there was another match on this card. At least it was inserted into the YouTube of this card, which was Jose Estrada against a very young Kurt Henning. Oh, time frame sounds about right. Maybe the, the this website uh, just missed it. Uh, I got yeah. Estrada won the match, and Kurt took bumps like. Kurt always took bumps, but it was really young, really skinny Kurt Henning. Uh, so and Henning wound up losing to Jose Estrada. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, was talking to Kurt Henning once. I was like, yeah, you know, you. This is when he was first in the WWF, getting a huge push in '89, and I just mentioned to him like, yeah, you've come a long way. I remember uh, you came to to Nashville, New Hampshire, and you lost to Charlie Fulton. He's like, yeah. I, come a long way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so your oh, buddy, once again, I'm trying to get out of talking about the world's heavyweight title match. The main event yes. is Bob Backlund against Playboy Buddy Rose. These two had a really good match in Boston and a really good match in Madison Square Garden. Chris, you saw it recently. What was this match like? So there's a couple interesting things here. There was this was a lumberjack match. Okay. So that was kind of fun because Buddy couldn't get out of the ring. SD Jones was the special guest referee. <laughs> he and that would have been once in Philadelphia. Yeah, that would have been before he started being billed from Antigua. And he was still being billed from Philly. So he was kind of the hometown guy there. Now, just a couple of months ago, he was the special referee for Backland Snook in Philly. Oh, really? Okay. Well, it's September 1982. Yeah. This is not. Huh. So, one thing that, first of all, this was a really, really good match. Because both these guys were phenomenal workers at this point. One thing that surprised me a little bit, because this was, what, about a year before Backland? Almost a year before Backland lost the title. Mm-hmm is that the Philly fans were absolutely nuts for Backlund. They were cheering him like you wouldn't believe. And I thought you'd maybe start to see a little bit more of that crack in the crack in the armor there. Not by this point. Okay. I mean, it, it, it really started to gain momentum like middle of 1983, maybe beginning of 1983. Like I remember in Boston, uh, Backlund had a series of matches against Magnificent Morocco, like uh, beginning slash spring of 1983. And me being very taken aback by how many people were booing Bob Backlund and, and cheering Morocco. You know, this was probably like the very end of, of peak Bob Backlund because right around this time, maybe not this match, but around here is when he kind of took a step back. And uh, as far as being a good worker, in my opinion, he was still really good here and he hadn't gone to where he was wearing the crew cut and the singlet either. So this was still kind of your classic Bob Backlund. He was, he was still pretty jacked at this point. And I guess 
when you think about it, Buddy Rose isn't someone you generally cheer. I mean, you can see someone cheering Snuka or Morocco or someone like that, but Buddy Rose is just, you know, excellent worker, but he played the sniveling, miserable heel so well. Yes. I mean, Buddy, he he, he was one of those guys, and I, I've talked about this before, in the WWF, he 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 sold too much. Like we were used to the heels coming in, just beating the crap out of jobbers. And Buddy Rose just didn't play that game. He wanted to have a good match. And at the end of the day, in the WWF, I think that hurt him. Yeah, it probably did. And you know, obvious. Buddy wasn't quite as big as he got later in his career. He, he was still a pretty pretty big guy. It was funny. They billed him at 256, and he did not correct the ring announcer. I was expecting to hear him do his whole thing where, you know, I weigh 216 pounds, whatever, you know, whatever he would say. Um, The other thing I noticed is, you know, he came to the ring with, you know, these two women who knows where they were from. And he kissed them both multiple times, and they really did not look like they were <laughs> in on that. <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah, this guy, ew. <laughs> I um you know what Chris as soon as this 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 recording is over uh if you could send me the the link to what you watched now I have to see this because I want to know oh, yeah. who these two girls were and if they were part of Moolah's stable or if he just hired them for the night and decided to have a little fun in the middle of the ring that's hilarious I, uh, I did not they didn't they could have been with some of Moolah's wrestlers but I didn't recognize them okay all right, I, I've got to see this. This is great. All right. Um, now, hopefully I won't forget the World's Heavyweight Championship this match. This time or skip over it. We go to the St. Paul Civic Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, where they had wrestling every Thanksgiving. Starts off with a midgets match. Then we go to Tom Lintz and Kenny J. I won't make a midget joke about Tom Lintz. Bobby Duncan against Steve Olsonowski. That goes to a time limit draw. A little bit of a surprise at first because I know Duncan was getting a big push. He was about to be become part of the AWA Tag Team Champions with Ken Patera. But Steve Olsonowski, like Vern Gagne, always liked him. Olsonowski was a vastly underrated wrestler. He was he was really really good in the ring. Uh, he so was a he was he still is a really good looking guy. He's a uh, He's like a financial advisor in town. I suppose maybe he might be retired now, but a few years ago, uh, he was a financial advisor in the picture on his website. He looked exactly the same. Oh, wow. You, you wouldn't have known he'd aged any. I can't remember what the story with him was. If he got hurt at some point or if he caught some illness that kind of derailed his career. He had a staph infection. That's right. That's what it was. And then he kind of just wrestled on and off part time, uh, you know, roles like this. Uh, I don't think he traveled much. I, he was one of Larry Zabisco's ninjas for a while. I remember that. I've mentioned before that, oh, God, what was it? It was, I have the smash on tape somewhere. It was him. I don't remember. It was him and someone else against Mass Superstar and I think King Tonga, who was later Meng. From the middle end. Yeah, and uh, Olsenowski was excellent in this match. He was just as good as ED or anyone else in the ring. I want to share, like, what Chris and I have known each other on the internet for over 20 years. And we we were talking about um, someone had brought up, like, you know, someone said something along the lines of Greg Gagne sucks. And you came out swinging. I remember this. This was great. And you were like, no, Greg Gagne was excellent. His tag team with Jim Brunzel was one of the greatest tag teams of all time. And you were like, they were the rock and roll express of that generation. And then I chime in and I'm like, and Greg Gagne could take care of himself outside the ring. I think that was the moment you and I became buddies. Oh, yeah, of course he could. He was a Division I athlete. He was Vern's kid, so he grew up in the business. The story I had always heard from about Greg, and I believe our, our mutual friend Brad Breitzman has told this story, is that Greg ended up coming down with a really bad case of mono at some point when he was young. And that was kind of one of the reasons he couldn't really put on weight like a lot of guys. I knew a guy when I was in high school who got mono 
And he was so sick, he didn't graduate with us. And he was, you it's know, terrible. Yeah, he was the, the starting tight end on our football team, and he got it after the season. And like he, he came back after three weeks, and then he was around for a couple of weeks after, and then he was out again after that. And I remember just hearing the news that, you know, hey, he's not going to graduate with us. It was pretty devastating. Yeah, I, I, got, I caught it in college, and it was I didn't have it as bad as some, but I knew guys – a couple of guys who actually had to drop out for a semester. It, it, it was going around at the time. Oh man. And it was, it was terrible for some of those guys. So yeah, I, I can totally see where that would cause you problems later on. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's basically what happened. They, they told me, you know, he was out three weeks and he was back a couple of weeks later and then he had to be out again. And they were like, you know, look, you you're, 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 you're just not going to make it. Sorry. And, you know, whatever. It was a very sad thing. So I was pals with this guy. Uh, but anyway, what, what, uh, Ken Patera defeats Baron Von Rashka. Chris, what was it like seeing Baron Von Rashka around the AWA at this point? He seems like he was very over. Oh, Baron is a legend here. I've told this before. I've not, I don't, I'm sure I didn't when I was on the show before. Um, there's a local brand of beer called Grain Belt. I'm not a fan of it, but they What's did a called? contest of Grain Belt. Okay, I thought you said Rheingold. I'm like, wow, that was out here in the 70s. But please go no, on. Grain Belt. It was it was originally brewed in Minneapolis, and then now it's brewed down in uh, New Ulm, Minnesota. Okay. So they had a contest a few years ago. Uh, this maybe 15 years ago, where you they had a bunch of people who were. Uh, I don't know if they were like major. I can't remember who was listed, but it was like, who's your Minnesota icon? And the Baron won that contest. No way. Yeah, way. Then this was like literally like 10, 15 years after he was done wrestling. Like over Tarkenton, over Herbeck, over Carew. Yeah, I don't know if it was people at that level. <laughs> I would ha- I'd have to dig it out to see who it was. But I remember that the Baron won it. He, the Baron, the Crusher, that era of AWA guys is very fondly remembered in the Twin Cities to this day. I mean, you know, that's the thing. Like, people will talk about, you know, oh, the AWA looks so terrible with guys like Baron Von Raschka and Mad Dog Rashawn. They're so old. But if they're over and they're selling tickets, they're doing their job. Oh, yeah. They, they were huge stars at, at this point. I mean, you know, three years later, then you kind of caught up with them quickly. But yeah, these guys were, they were the heroes around here at that time. Uh, people loved them and people love them to this day and talk about them to this day. That's that's absolutely true. Yeah. I have and- a Baron Von Raschka Remco figure on my desk at work. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I sold all of them. I kept the Baron. <laughs> Is that a topic of conversation where you work? I had originally given it to my old boss uh-huh. uh, to put on his desk, and he retired. And when he left, he left it on my desk. He didn't take it with him. So, yeah. Okay. All right. But uh, I'm, I'm now one of the older people at work. So, oh, oh. no, I'm sure most of the people wouldn't know who he is. All right. <laughs> you and I both, brother. You and I yeah. both. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Ken Patera. Now, a year earlier, Ken Patera was in Georgia. And I'm like, this guy is awesome. Again, he is someone that I thought could be NWA champion. I, I, I thought he was someone that would be WWF champion. I was looking forward to him uh, coming up here right around this time in 1982 and finally unseating Bob Backlund. That never happened. He was part of a tag team in the AWA. Any thoughts on, on 1982 Ken Patera from you? So Patera was still pretty good here. This was before the angle where I believe this was before the angle where Jer- uh, where Bobby Heenan sold his contract to the Sheik. Okay. For, I can't remember how, I think they said $100,000. I literally just watched this interview, but I don't remember what the amount that they said was. It was some ridiculous amount. I'm pretty sure it was a hundred grand. Yeah. Um, And then he ended up donning the Sheik outfit and winning the tag titles with Blackwell. Not too long after this, uh, because Al Casey couldn't really go in the ring anymore because of his, uh, he had a bad back injury. But Patera was still good. I I kind of thought him and Blackwell dressed up as, you know, Sheiks was ridiculous. I still think, though, 
that to this day uh it would i think they would have been better off as just kind of a badass tag team instead of you know dealing with adnan's silliness and wailing and swords and belly dancers and everything that went along with that uh el casey was around the awa probably way way too long <laughs> oh yeah not yet by 82 but he i mean he he hung around forever Oh, he was there till the very end. He still lives in town, I believe. Oh, nice. I don't think he lives very far from me, actually. <laughs> say, I would drive by and say, hey, I was on a podcast where you got the uh, the host into wrestling when you were Billy White Wolf in 1976. <laughs> um, I, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I always thought I, I didn't have to watch it on TV, but I, I saw it in the magazines. Uh, we're talking about Patera and uh, – and, blackwell as the sheiks and i was like okay a this is kind of silly but b it kind of makes them look like total sellouts like okay sheik adnan gives them enough gives them enough money and here they are you know posing uh, you know wearing traditional arabic garb yeah and i was i was seriously wondering i was watching some of these interviews i'm like where did they get enough cloth to make that thing for blackwell i mean <laughs> he was huge Blackwell was absolutely huge. And, you know, it was funny. He, uh, in 1978, he came back to the WWF with the Grand Wizard as his manager, and it looked like he was getting a really big push. And all of a sudden, the guy disappeared. I always wondered what happened, but I heard the story about him uh, coming back to the WWF in 1984. They announced him, you know, he's going to be on TNT next week. And he never showed up. And the story was he was sitting around waiting to do interviews. And it, it took so long. He just said, screw it. And he got up and left. So maybe something similar happened in 78. It could have been. The other story I heard is that it, this, this was in St. Louis. They were going to debut him. Because they always, the WWF would always debut guys in a territory that they were familiar in. And the other story I heard is Blackwell felt guilty and left and went back to Vern. Huh, I could see that. Okay. All right. And let me see. Now, we have Jerry Blackwell and Sheik Adnan El Casey defeating Mad Dog Vachon and Jim Brunzel by disqualification. Chris, do you know why where Greg Gagne was on this night? Why was Vachon teaming with Brunzel? Do you, do you know? I have no idea. I have no idea, and I tried to figure this out last night, and I could not. All so right. there were three notable people not on this card. Greg was one of them. I don't know where he would have been at this point, because he wrestled with Brunzel before and after this. Maybe he was just home on Thanksgiving? I'm not sure. Doesn't sound like something you can do with the promoter's son. I don't know. It doesn't. Uh, the second person, and I don't know where he was, was Jesse Ventura who was active in the AWA at this point, and you would have thought would have been on this card. Yep. And the third was Hogan. And I did find where Hogan is, was because his match history is so well documented. Hogan was teaming with Inoki in the New Japan Tag Tourney. Okay, I was going to say, this This sounds like right around the time where Hogan would, would be in Japan. So yeah, that makes sense. Yep. He was in Japan for about two months here, and they defeated Alcanic. And Pero Aguayo that same night. Oh, wow. Nice. So those were the three people that I thought were noticeably absent from this card. Okay. All right. Cheek on and El Casey. Now, I remember getting a wrestling magazine in the beginning of 1981, mid-1981, and just staring at this person and being like, is that Billy White Wolf? And I'm like taking out pictures of White Wolf and trying to figure it out. And I was like, oh, my God, he is now a chic in the AWA. What a crazy business. Yeah, except that was his real background. Not that he was a chic, but he was from Iraq. Yes. That was legit. He wasn't a Native American. <laughs> he was not from Ardmore, Oklahoma, as Billy White Wolf no. was, was said to have been no. from. So, I mean, aside from reading the result of one Billy White Wolf match uh, in Nat Lubitz, one Nat Lubitz magazines from like 77 or 78, like this guy had completely vanished between, as far as I know, between his WWF stay in 1977 when Ken Patera broke his neck and put him out of wrestling until he appeared uh, as the as Sheik Adnan in 1981. And funny, then he ended up buying Patera's contract. 
It really was <laughs> just weird how things work out. Uh, okay, and finally, I'm not going to miss the world title match again. Nick Bockwinkle, the champion uh, versus Rick Martell, ends without a winner as a no contest. I would put every dime I had on this being an excellent match. Oh, absolutely. Both of them were so good throughout their entire career, and they had some great matches together. I really, I understand why it happened because Vern got paid for it, but it would have been a lot better if Martel would have won the title from Bachwinkle instead of from Jumbo Ceruta. You know, I, I agree, and I, I, I've always saw, even like before I started getting the newsletters, I understood the booking behind that, that, you know, Nick Bockwick could say, hey, this Rick Martell guy, he never beat me. But you're right, it, it, in a way that did hurt Rick Martell as champion, like he could have used that little boost. Like, yeah, he's, he was the guy who finally put Nick Bockwinkle away as world heavyweight champion. Yep. And I said th- that would have helped, but yeah, these two guys, the, the, both, either one of them would have put on a clinic and this pretty much would have been right around both of their prime years here. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and plus it's obviously a big show. You're not going to go out there and, and beach it on Thanksgiving night. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would not be a bit surprised if this, match ended uh because of a bobby heenan interference that sounds right to me we're running a little bit late but i want to get one more of these shows in uh the thanksgiving day 1982 from the jacksonville veterans memorial coliseum in florida uh scott mcgee starts out by beating the texan i don't know why i tried very hard to find out who this version of the texan was i could not so did i I have no idea. I couldn't find it. And most Florida guys, I have an idea, but you know, not not in this case. But Scott McGee, an excellent in ring talent, but after that, it the whole thing kind of runs out of gas. Not very good on interviews. Not charismatic. He just didn't have the look. But he was really good in the ring. He was like Les Thornton. He was a lot like Les Thornton, as a matter of fact. Well, they're, they were both British. They both came up through that, that kind of style. He was recently on oh, either one of the Tales of the Territories or he was on Dark Side of the Ring. I, I know I've recently seen Scott McGee somewhere. I could be wrong. Maybe he's not, maybe he's not around anymore, but I, I'm almost positive I've seen him interviewed very recently. I have not seen him in a long time, but I remember after his WWF run, he went on to Calgary as, uh, what was he, Garfield Porch or something like that, and he just didn't get over there either. Yep, that's his real name. All right, and he was doing like the snotty British guy, and it just didn't work. Uh, Penny Mitchell beats Terry Shane. Then we have Brian Blair defeating Jim Garvin by disqualification. I've mentioned this on the show before, but it's been a while. Jim Garvin's career had been floundering from like uh, mid-79 when he got the big push in Florida as Killer Carl Cox's protege, uh, and you know, just not going anywhere he was like mid middle of the card in mid-south he was middle of the card in georgia then 82 once again can't uh rediscover the magic just an, uh, just another guy and then he goes to the gorgeous jimmy gimmick which kept his career alive for at least another 10 years and this is where it first yep. started like right around november 1982 yeah, and he was excellent in world class. He was excellent in the AWA. Kind of came down off a little bit when he was uh, when he became a freebird. I never really liked that. No. But yeah, I mean, he was he was great on the mic. He was good in the ring. I never had anything bad to say about about Jimmy Garvin. No, when he became a free bird, I mean, obviously he was long past uh, his prime, and it felt like both he and Michael Hayes kind of. Uh, internally quit or they quit without telling anybody uh but yeah he had a really good run in the wrestling business starting right around uh 40 years ago today yep all right uh kevin sullivan defeats barry windham there is a backstory to this they announced that kevin sullivan is returning to florida our, our good friend mike graham's good friend kevin sullivan former tag team partner and steve kern comes out and he's like 
I was wrestling in Tennessee with Kevin Sullivan, and he is a completely different guy. He's changed. I no longer get along with him. I don't think anyone else should. Hey, Kevin Sullivan shows up in Florida like, what, 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 what are you talking about, Steve? And then, you know, Kevin Sullivan immediately goes hardcore heel. So, again, one of those, those little things in wrestling that I, I really miss. And this is pre-Devil Worship, right? This is right around the time it's going to start. But, yes, it was uh, pre-Purple Devil Robe, Kevin. Okay. All right. Then we have Kendo Nagasaki uh, defeats Ron Bass. Ron Bass is somehow a babyface here. Well, he's a babyface, so they could turn him in 83 on Dusty Rhodes. Kendo Nagasaki, an obvious great Kabuki ripoff. Yes. I remember seeing him in I saw him live, I believe, at the first live card I ever attended, oh, which wow. was a Pro Wrestling USA card. And yeah, it was, he was dollar store kabuki. He, he you know, and I, I don't have anything bad to say about the guy, but, you know, he's he's got the skullet going on. He's got the silly makeup that, you know, kabuki looked a lot more sinister. And this guy just not was in shape. Green stuff, too. Yes, he did. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, they they tried so hard to get him over in Florida. I mean, they had him beat up Eddie Graham at one point. So, but it, it just didn't get over the way they wanted. But yeah, Kevin Sullivan getting the big push beats Barry Windham. Then we have N- Nagasaki over Bass, so Nagasaki's getting the big build up. Bruce Walkup defeats the Florida's main manager James J. Dillon. Chris, what do you know about Bruce Walkup? Well, funny you should ask. Ah. I looked the guy up last night. I had never heard of him. He, I guess what I could tell is he was maybe kind of a local guy who wanted to get into the business, was there for a few years. But he once had an empty arena cage match with Terry <laughs> Funk. And what were your observations of that empty arena cage match with Terry Funk? Why the hell did that even happen? I mean, I got the empty arena match with Lawler. I, that made sense in the in the uh, the way that feud was done. Who's this guy, and why is he wrestling in an empty arena cage match with Terry Funk? He's just some guy. I, that has to be his claim to fame. <laughs> oh, it most certainly is. <laughs> Bruce walk up. They did this angle, and I once again, it's like the third time I've said this, maybe the fourth. I miss little stuff like this, where Bruce walk up his gimmick was that he was a welder. He was a welder in real real life who wanted to get into wrestling. He had the guts and everything else, and he got a little bit of a short-term push in Florida before he finally got out of wrestling and went back to welding and was never heard from again. But I just love little storylines like that that used to be in the wrestling business. Yes. Quick, uh, quick note back to what we were talking about before. Uh, Scott McGee is still alive, and he was on the Dynamite Kid uh, episode of Dark Side of the Ring. Ah, okay. All right. So, yeah, but if you, if you, dear listener, have not seen that empty arena cage match with Terry Funk, I thought it was absolutely great because they're about to do Dusty Rhodes versus Terry Funk for the millionth time in Florida, and it got Terry Funk, in my opinion – over as this completely deranged animal who just absolutely destroyed Bruce Walkup. I wasn't getting Florida TV at the time. This may uh, that may have been Bruce Walkup's last match because Funk just destroyed him. But Funk did a, a phenomenal job in that cage. I thought getting himself over. I loved it. Dusty Rhodes. I got to talk about this again. Defeats Ernie Ladd. Ernie Ladd is, when I saw his picture in the magazines, I'm like, okay, this guy is getting very old. And I believe this was, I believe this was his last run in Florida, like late 1982, occasionally teaming with Big John Studd. Yeah, he had a run in Mid-South after that, and then he was pretty much done at that point by 84, 85. I have always thought uh, Ernie Ladd in Mid-South in 1984, again, looked very old, but they gave him a quick run with the North American Championship, you know, the the top guy in Mid-South wrestling. And I always thought that was kind of Bill Watts 
uh, giving him a retirement gift. Yep, it says he retired in '86. Okay, I remember. I remember Ernie Ladd doing Texas All Star Wrestling in 1985, or maybe it was late '86. And I mean, he, I mean, his knees were shot. He looked old facially, but I always loved Ernie Ladd. One of my favorite wrestling promos of all time. Oh, he was one of the best talkers of all time. He's another guy you could totally see being an NWA champion if he wasn't so big. Yeah, you know, there's a way you could have made that work to his advantage, in my opinion. I think he would have been in the early mid 70s. I think he would have been a great NWA champion. Oh, yeah. And especially because he had the legitimate athletic background as a, yes. as a great football player. Yeah, he was a you know, uh, an All American, first team All American at Grambling, and then he went on to have a big career with the San Diego Chargers. And finally, we have the team of Rufus R. Jones and Charlie Cook. I, I've mentioned this on the show before. Charlie Cook has been unfairly demonized ever since Ric Flair's book came out like twenty years ago. Surprisingly, defeating the team of Angelo Mosca and Jake Roberts. Uh, Mosca was pretty bad at this point his career and jake roberts you know we always think of jake roberts the maybe the mid-south jake roberts of 1985-ish or the wwf jake roberts where he comes in as a heel turns into a great baby face and turns into one of the greatest heel ever before his uh his demons frankly caught up with him this is jake when he is still fairly green and I was always surprised when I read when I, I read the magazines. I was very surprised when I saw that he was now a heel in Florida because I had only known Jake Roberts as a babyface in Mid South and Mid Atlantic. But right now, this point in his career, the correct role for him is the bad guy. So uh, this would have been before I ever saw Jake. Uh, my first remembrance of Jake was as part of the Legion of Doom in Georgia with the Road Warriors and Bundy. That was his first big push in a big promotion when he left Florida for Georgia with uh, and had Paul Ellering as his manager. Yeah. So I never saw Jake. I would have never seen him in 82. Um, I can imagine that Moscow was pretty bad at this point because when he was managing his kid a year or so later, he was pretty awful. It was brutal. It seems like kind of a strange pairing, to be honest. Ah. This big old football player monster guy with basically i mean jake had to look more like his brother sam houston at that point yes he did and skinny as a rail yeah he was he was noticeably thin at this point in his career he was very tall and i'm sure he was a big guy but he just didn't have a lot of bulk right and he never carried a lot of bulk but yeah i mean it, it just it's it just seems like kind of an unusual pairing but i don't know the i don't know the deal behind the angle either so i can't really speak to that well, you, and I, once again, I miss wrestling like this. You would see all of the heels together. Like, they were all pals in that dressing room, you know, whether it be, I mean, you'd see, you know, Ric Flair and Ole Anderson and Ivan Koloff and Greg Valentine hanging out together. And you'd be like, you know, on TV, and you'd be like, wow, you know, this all looks weird, but that's the way wrestling was back then. It's just, you know, all the bad guys are all best buddies, and same thing with the good guys. Yes. All right. One last thing, Chris, thank you for coming on. Uh, One last result from Salem, Oregon, Thanksgiving 1982. They had a cage match with Ali Hassan defeating Brett Sawyer. Ali Hassan's real name was Jack Kruger. He was a referee with the WWF in the the mid 80s, and he he just looked awful. He was doing this. evil middle middle eastern guy and on the back of his trunks it said one word oil o-i-l and he had this <laughs> eye like right in the crack of his ass <laughs> oh my god i i meant to look up uh who he was and i didn't get around to it but all right here's a trivia question for you on that same card who okay. was the assassin oh i know this i think i know this the guy the guy who trained El Gigante, what's his name? The the Cuban assassin guy. I'm trying to uh. Dave Sierra. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I kind of guessed that. All right, I'll give you one more quick one. Okay. What is his claim to fame? 
or one of them? A uh, one of them. I'm thinking either training. Oh wait, there's a couple. He kind of, how do I put this, uh, was in be- was part of a deal to get Bill Alfonso in World Championship Wrestling. Uh, he he and Alfonso apparently were good friends. They might have been related. Okay. And he agreed to come in and kind of be El Gigante's, not only his interpreter, but kind of, I want to say his babysitter outside the ring. But Gigante spoke no English and was on the road every night. And he needed someone who spoke Spanish to help him out and train him. So that, that I think that's number one. Is it? That Okay, that could be true. I didn't know that. But what I was going to say is he was Flair's final territorial that's right. NWA title defense in Portland. Portland in 89, I want to say. It might have been that late. Um, I think Flair had some matches up there on kind of sold JCP shows, like maybe against Dusty or someone. But he was the last territorial champion defense of the NWA title up there. And he was wrestling as top gun. Yeah, I was aware of the match, but I was unaware that it was Flair's last NWA championship defense outside of, you know, JCP or what eventually turned into WCW. Yep. I believe that was his last territorial defense. All right. Chris, you were once again a fantastic guest. Thank you very much for for being part of Stick to Wrestling. Thank you. I had a blast. I always want to hear that. That's always what I want to hear from our guest. And um, I want to thank everyone for listening. I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving yesterday. And I want to thank uh, Brian Last for giving me this uh, this forum. I want to thank Lou Kippelman for all the great work he does producing Stick to Wrestling. You guys have no idea. I, I want to thank all of you for listening. Uh, please come back next week. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. This concludes our podcast day.